hope it is. Yeah, recording has started. Now I'm going to come off the screen and go into the PowerPoint screen here. And with that, I would, uh, well, let's get this up here. One second. There we go. There we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce uh, Tom Smirtnek, owner for Energy Aspects LLC, uh, ISA board member, and uh, uh, Cyber Informed Engineering Collaborator has been working with the uh, Cyber Informed Engineering crew for for uh, years now, actually, not just uh, two, years. two years now. Um, at and the Idaho National Labs. At the Idaho National Labs. And uh, this would be our September 2025 Tech Talk for the ISA Twin Cities chapter. And with that, Tom, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, EJ. Uh, thanks, everybody who's dialed in or uh, attending here at Dunwoody. Um, as EJ mentioned, I um, have been with ISA for quite a while, and for the last couple of years, I've decided to uh, get involved with some of the work that that Idaho National Labs, otherwise known as INL, as we speak in acronyms in, these, in this industry, um, uh, was was tagged by the Department of Energy, otherwise known as DOE, to assemble a community of practice practitioners educated and knowledgeable in cybersecurity, control systems, critical infrastructure, and those who may have an interest from an IT perspective to learn more about it. And as volunteers, it's much like ISA, it's a volunteer organization, community of practice, and we're looking into how to define how to for what is cyber-informed engineering otherwise affectionately known as CIE. It is a continuation of something that Idaho National Labs had done in a consequence-driven cyber-informed engineering, CCE, a couple of years ago under their own internal research and development. And they posted that to DOE and DOE said, we need this more formally, fill it out, you know, do more. So next, uh, next slide. DJ. Yeah. Um, so as this says, this is this is talking about cybersecurity and operations or operational technology. I'll be doing. I did a little bit of an intro, intro working an overview, and there's going to be a training example here describing what CIE um, community of practice has been doing. Next slide. So what is cybersecurity? And there's a definition here. And this was presented by the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, otherwise known as CISA. Okay. That is what is cybersecurity. Next, we look at what is it when it's slightly changed or it's written, but what's missing from this picture? Okay. What's mi missing is CISA does not have any engineers or operations technology people in it. They're all IT people. And they've been, they've come from basically uh, looking at what is in how to protect information technology, not how to do, uh, not how to protect operations technology. So that's why we're highlighting that. We're trying to help them also come up to speed with how to protect operations technology, what we've come to know as OT. So, like I said, it's not just about data. There's these events that occur virtually every day, somewhere around the world. Uh, Paul may have a statistic on how often this happens around the world. Um, and it's, <laughs> Here is a, uh, a posit. If Colonial Pipeline was purely an IT security event, why does it keep coming up as an OT security case study? And it's because, as we came to know, Colonial Pipeline's operations executives weren't confident that they had enough cybersecurity on their OT side, if any, to keep the lateral movement from the enterprise side to get in and disrupt operations. So they manually pressed the big red switch. They said, we're going to shut it down. That way we'll know it's protected. Nobody can get any oil, gas, whatever they were putting down their pipeline. And we'll recover from that once we know we're, we're fully secure. So um, that's a, a, a different form of denial of service. 
because it was a voluntary, but it's still a denial of service. Um, so if we look at it graphically, we talk about cybersecurity in operational technology, and there's these cyber attack impacts. And we see the box around cyber, uh, called cybersecurity protections around information technology. And within information technology, there's typically operations technology, right? You've got the enterprise side, and then you've got the manufacturing side or the operations side, which includes the facility, right? Connected and communicating equipment. And that can fall into the Venn diagram where it says control systems. But if you're a heavy industry, you've also got physical processes that are based on some engineering. And you see the cybersecurity protections do not extend to that portion of the Venn diagram. This is what cyber-informed engineering was created to do, to try and train resources to create good engineering controls that will protect the physical processes or what we sometimes refer to as cyber physical systems um, and the engineering side, okay, up, up to the control systems. So in a graphical method, um, this is um, to introduce security controls engineered into the equipment and subsystems to protect the, si the system from the outset in contrast to trying, pay, and trying to paste cybersecurity after installation and commissioning, which is where we've lived for the last, well, since whenever automation was created, right? And we started having to look at cybersecurity and protections of, of equipment and personnel. So we start looking deeper into how do cyber attacks affect physical infrastructure? And we know that since most of the things happened, all of the cyber attacks have really gone after the enterprise level. So it's an IT approach, hoping to gain access through some phishing or some intrusion and breaching the, the cybersecurity that the IT people have put up. And we know that ransomware has been the predominant scheme, is to be able to get in, gain control, capture data, lock the owners of the data out of it and then hold them for ransom. We know this has been done by nation states or subsidiaries of nation states uh, looking to, um, to gain access to monies that they can, you know, through ransom. And they're just using commodity tools and tactics and techniques. It's nothing really super novel. I mean, some of them have been relatively uh, ingenious and we'll get into more of that. And, and look at the amount of money that they've been able to pull, 27 to 50, 450 million in the time that we're talking about here from 2010 forward. Um, and we know that there's multiple nation states. There's Iran, there's North Korea, there's China, there's Russia, there's subsidiaries of them who have been trained and enabled and have, have been spawned as being part of their nation state hacker core, and then have been blown out into the wind to create their own capabilities, their own chaos. And so we know that what's been happening is that 50% of the identified incidents impacted some kind of process or discrete manufacturing. So we know that there's been lateral movement out of the enterprise IT into operations technology. There's been production shutdowns, et cetera, um, supply chain issues, as we as we know. <laughs> the recent um, nation state impact in on um, um, it, I want to say Gaza, but it's to Hamas. Is it Hamas or Hezbollah? Which was it? It was a nation. It was Israel. Um, well, the pagers was Hezbollah. The pager. It was Hezbollah. Yeah. Okay, so against Hezbollah. So that's a that's a way to hack a, a supply chain and being able to influence what happens and, and make that happen. So we see it you know happening in on both sides of the coin. And so the largest impacts there at the next to last button is with um, including IT dependencies and abundance of caution shutdowns. That was a colonial pipeline, right? It was an abundance of caution. 
And then there's OT related supply chain and tax attacks are increasing. We know that these attacks are increasing. Next, next slide. So we start to talk about some predictions that ransomware attacks with OT consequences will increase. We just know this is going to happen. And we know it because in 2024, we had the Philadelphia Small Municipal Water System that had Unitronics PLCs in it, right? And those were hacked. And we don't know, I haven't been able to keep up with residual impacts of that, but we know Unitronic systems, there was a breach and they affected the operations of those Unitronic based PLC systems. And I suspect it was, it was a pumping system, possibly a booster pump in a, in a municipal water. Um, here's one, the, the Volt Typhoon was described in, by TechCrunch magazine in February that it's a it's a Chinese backed it's a China backed um, hack group of hackers, and they've been lurking in critical infrastructure for at least five years. Is what that magazine tech magazine has said. And then in April, Reuters updated it, saying that they've now been able to determine that they put in a botnet, which goes in and just it can hang for a while. It finds, it looks for vulnerabilities, looks for gaps, act on, acts on it. And if you're not <laughs> a very, very sharp person who is constantly looking for that one and you, you stop your cybersecurity gaze while chasing a new vulnerability or something else, maybe the botnet will act. Um, here's the, uh, I think it's Zyxel firewalls, Ars Technica in July of last year. Um, the Zyxel users are getting hacked by uh, direct denial of service botnet. And that's it, that emerged last year as, the, as a public nuisance number one. There it says, uh, a quote from, from Ars Technica says, 12 weeks after critical vulnerability was patched, devices are still being wrangled. So those botnets just lay in wait. They act if they're not cleaned or somebody doesn't, or they, they stop working and some cybersecurity person says, well, I can't find out how it's working now. It stopped working. How do you clean it if you can't find it, right? So there's a lot of different types of uh, cybersecurity solutions that are meant for all that. In the water sector, this is where we're starting to pull, come down into what CIE is all about. There's the Federal News Network for May of this year against your water utilities. That's the one that I mentioned in with the Unitronics. About 70% of utilities impact inspected by federal officials over the last year violated standards meant to prevent breaches or other intrusions. Recent cyber attacks by groups affiliated with Russia and Iran have targeted smaller communities. So we know that that's what's happening. And that's where that graphic is. That's kind of a Unitronics PLC up there. So let's go to the next, next slide. So, and then, and then the next one. So based upon critical infrastructure and what the Department of Energy wanted to do about our national grid, our bulk electrical grid. Uh, they decided to partner with Idaho National Labs and they funded them to create a cyber informed engineering community of practice. And what it does is it, you know, it's, it's, we're designing it to help engineers understand because a lot of engineers in, in traditional power systems don't get much, never did get much network connectivity and communication training. They were focused on power, you know, how to, how to control and clean power, deliver, transmit, distribute clean power. And so they didn't get the communication side. And so we know that that's one thing that engineers who are in touching the operations technology the most need to become more aware of, to get better trained on. And so what, what CIE offers is the opportunity to use engineering to eliminate specific harmful consequences by thoroughly designing, more thoroughly designing systems from the outset and through its operational life cycle, rather than add cybersecurity controls after they've been designed. And we know that with existing IT networks, that's all existing equipment that gets hacked all the time. There's no built-in hardware cybersecurity in the modems and the routers 
and the HMIs and the PLCs, that's just beginning to come into play. And, and being focused on engineers and technicians, two-year and four-year degree individuals, CIE is providing this framework in our education working group for cyber education awareness and accountability. And then what we want to do is create a culture of security, much like as you, you folks have heard me talk about how W. Edwards Deming uh, helped the Japanese with quality control, a closed loop approach to quality control. And then we picked it up finally, what, a decade or 15 years later, and Jack Welch turned it into a whole new business cycle with his Six Sigma. I think we need some SEC. Sigma is what we need. SEC for security. Uh, next, next one. Next slide. So, as I passed out some, some folks here, and if anybody wants one of the uh, the binders, here on the on the slide is the National Cyber Informed Engineering Strategy, and it outlines some core concepts. Uh, there's a set of design, operations, and organizational principles, and this is somewhat patterned after how ISA and ISA 99 created and helped working with the IEC create 6243, right? Um, segments one and two of 62443 really talk about operational type of stuff. I mean, organizational type of stuff, how to set up a program for cybersecurity. We're, we're essentially doing the same thing with academic education, uh, implementation for industrial and commercial, and then standards harmonization with things like, in fact, there was a standards working group today that I went to this morning that we're working with ASME, which is what, EJ, what is the it's ASME? The American Society for Mechanical Engineers. For Mechanical Engineers. And they have put together a cybersecurity appendix for one of their standards. And they, our CIE directors, found out about that, invited one of their liaisons in the sta their standards group to come and talk to us. And now we're building this collaboration with ASME on one of theirs. So it's pretty, pretty fun stuff. Um, as you can see there, there's five integrated pillars uh, that offer recommendations to incorporate CIE as a common practice for control systems engineers. And it's CIE has been named in the National Cyber Strategy and the National Cyber St Strategy Implementation Plan uh, by the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. There's a link there, and you'll be able to see that when you view the YouTube video that EJ will put up after we're done here into the um, ISA Dunwoody YouTube page. Next slide. So here's the pillars of the national strategy. It's awareness where we try and promulgate a universal and shared understanding of what is CIE. What does cyber informed engineering mean? Because we're not just talking about, um, we're not just talking about um, controls engineers, but we wanna focus on engineers because they don't get the networking education in most of the degree programs. If they're in electronics where they are and maybe gonna go to work for an IT OEM company, they do of course, but that's a very small segment of the engineering population that gets graduated every year. So we need a more expansive application. And then we also have to look at existing people, existing teams where there's existing critical infrastructure that's vulnerable. And we need to get the teams bolstered. So that's the education part embed CIE into formal education, training, and credential. There's a development where we're building the body of knowledge and more on that. We're talking about current infrastructure and how to apply these CIE principles to existing systemically important critical infrastructure, which we know is bulk electricity, water and wastewater, um, agriculture, and a variety of other ones, pharmaceuticals, um, et cetera. So, and then future infrastructure. So conduct, we're, we're conducting research and development and then develop an industrial base to build CIE into new infrastructure systems and emerging technologies. So all these, these are the five pillars of the national CIE strategy. Next slide. These are the principles. It's somewhat of an eye chart, but uh, I'll let you take a couple of minutes to look at that. And this is what, before all the working groups for education and standards and implementation got created, 
we just had the community of practice that was setting up how to define what is CIE. So we wanted to make it so that it was consequence focused. That was pulling material from the prior iteration, consequence based cyber informed engineering. Of course, it was about engineered controls. How do I implement controls to reduce avenues for attack or damage? And we, we, we set up a number of questions that is part of our implementation program so that people can ask themselves in their organizations in following these principles and how to implement CIE in their companies in training, building teams to self-train or to build a training program. And INL is, and all the community of practice is willing to help companies and educational institutions do that. And you see here we're on the bottom one in cybersecurity culture, we're talking about focused on roles. So it's role aligned with the company's security goals. Next one. So here's the organization. The CIE community of practice and the working group, working group's purpose. So there, this, this presentation was put together by the director, Virginia Wright, who's brilliant in her own right. She's been presenting something similar to this to various governmental agencies and getting a lot of, wow, and this is, this is great. How can we help? So that's a good thing. We've got a lot of work to do moving forward. But I'm, I'm sitting on all three of these and been fairly active. Um, so I had to, I had to kind of minimize my ISA at the national level to get involved with this. I'm still working with Glenn Merrill. You guys know who Glenn Merrill is? He's a cap who has his own consulting firm in Colorado, and he's been part of the ISA 99, along with Joe Weiss, who's the managing director, um, who I've go gotten to know. And between Glenn, Glenn is continuing in the workforce development subgroup of ISA 99, but he also is a liaison to INL in the CIE program because the ISA 99 is now collaborating with this to make sure that what they develop can get pulled into here and vice versa. Um, this is what I'd like to see the education working group. I'd like to see some of this mapped out into Dunwoody as we move forward. And the implementation working group is really with an open source library that's available and, and we'll have a chart that uh, I think we have a chart here. And so um, Ginny added a note here. It says in 2023, um, CSER through the national labs initiated a CIE community and multiple working groups in response to the tr strategic recommendations to one, lead a CIE awareness campaign to support a shift in the culture of energy infrastructure engineering and operations. And two, develop policy initiative and build partnerships to incentivize the broad adoption of CIE in the energy energy industry. So we do have a focus on energy, but the community of practice aid the CSER and the labs to understand the needs of universities, standards organizations, asset owners, engineering design organizations, and vendors and tool providers for the energy sector. But we're really more broad brush than that. We have people from pharmaceutical companies. We have people from water utilities around the country. We have people from oil and gas in process. So it's a very broad based community of practice. Oh, we have an implementation guide. And in the appendix of the implementation guide is an example of CIE applied to a water sector project. We'll get into that more in a moment. In that case study, a specific system is examined with specific system consequences and the engineered solutions to them to my, mitigate them that the team that the team who's doing the exercise creates. This example allows teams to explore what implementation of CIE on their systems engineering projects might look like. Okay, so the URL there, if you're writing that down, you or you can wait till you see the video. 
But if you write that down, you can go and get the actual implementation guide. It allows you to download it from the uh, the um, the government's open systems technology information sharing site. Okay. And uh, any of you hackers out there, you also are welcome to it. Um, next slide. So here's the here's the current activities. As I mentioned, working with standards bodies, we have our first collaboration with ASME and their appendix, and that was just today. And the uh, the liaison from ASME was having some IT issues with his home computer, so we were hoping to get that uploaded to the INL uh, box site. They use box, and we can all collaborate on adding our you know, posing questions about how we want to do it. And there's been an overall arching question is, is there intellectual property here that we have to be careful of? Because ASME is its own society. And if they've created that for one of their standards, we know how ISA would feel about trying to share that material, don't we? They probably would not disallow it unless there was some kind of image building capability that would come from working with INL. And ISA already has that. They're already working with INA. So somewhat a moot point, but still the same. We have to look at it. We're working with the Power Engineering Society with IEEE and others. And of course, the ISA 99, IEC 6443. There is a university in that Sean McBride that EJ has spoken with up in um, Idaho State University, um, much like Dunwoody has applied science program that's being driven by someone who has worked with INL and the CIE group for uh, longer than I have. I've been there two years, two and 40 years. So Dr. McBride is trying to implement this at Idaho State. And, um, and there's several other ones. Auburn's doing it, uh, University of Texas, San Antonio. Um, I think Champaign-Urbana is on the verge of pulling something out this coming next fall. Uh, and then, of course, working with asset owners, we're looking to, to um, I don't know, I don't know if MITRE is considered a, an asset owner. They manage some assets for government agencies and such. And that's one that we are working with because they have a framework. They have a cybersecurity framework, MITRE does. And so we're trying to help them incorporate CIE principles into ongoing efforts, refine their products, and then create some templates for cyber informed designs. So we got some pretty good, interesting work. I, I enjoy working on it. And invite anybody else who wants to get involved to do that. So if we start and we start talking about, okay, so this is all fine and good, but but how do you CIE? And we start talking about things like, um, does anybody recognize this? I don't know if you can read it, it's an eye chart. In the dark blue, it says 62443 1 1 1 2, 1 1 3, and 1 4. So, this is the IEC, ISA, IEC 62443 principles for cybersecurity. It's now a global horizontal standard for cybersecurity. How to set up your, your concepts and models for your general master glossary of terms and abbreviations, system security conformance metrics. Industrial automation, control system security, life cycle, and use cases. That's the that's the kind of the organizational how you map your company's approach into a 62443 framework. And then here we have the NIST cybersecurity framework, CSF otherwise, acronym, and how it's there's a conceptual design and scope, very similar to, of course, NIST CSF has heard me some input from ISA 99. And then when it became 6443. So there was some uh, work by NIST to make it collaborative. Here we have the cyber informed or consequence driven cyber informed engineering process, four phases, consequence prioritization, so consequence driven, system of systems analysis, consequence-based targeting, determine the adversary's path to achieve the highest impact effects and what information is required to achieve those goals. 
So this is all the backdrop of why we're doing what we're doing with cyber informed engineering, how we're trying to formulate the guidance in what we produce by synthesizing some of all this and providing academic and institutional um, guidance, how to start your own program, how to look at roles, et cetera. This is an ISA, Cyber Process Hazard Analysis, otherwise known as HAZOP. And here's the book, ISA. Um, Jim McGlone has been a long-term, long-time uh, uh, president of a section out east. And this is the this is the same step, step seven, planning prep. Structure analysis, functional analysis, and failure analysis, risk analysis, optimization, and then results documentation. So this is the same systemic, systematic approach, pardon me, a proven method to assess industrial control system cybersecurity risk. Okay, for consequence-based cybersecurity. So there's a there's a textbook you can get from ISA. And these are all inputs to our CIE process both through direct work with ISA and referencing these, as well as subject matter experts who are part of our community of practice. So as we've tried to distill, we of course have come up with our own kind of processes. Build a concept, whether you're looking at a, if you're looking to in your company or in, if you're trying to train some engineers, and you want to build a concept around what do you want to do to update your cybersecurity training or your engineering training to include now cybersecurity training, education, knowledge. You put up a set of requirements, but they're more effective and efficient when applied here in requirements, right? Because that's that we all know as engineers, you need a requirements document that then becomes a specification, right? First, it's concept, concepts, and then it kind of molds into, well, what do those concepts require us to do? And then you formalize those into a set of specifications, and you can begin putting, putting your design teams on it. And then your design and development, testing, validation, verification, and then deployment, working it in operations, both out, uh, alpha, beta testing, and then full deployment, continuing maintenance, that's the life cycle, and then you finally come to a retirement or replacement. But there's a lot of things to do with cybersecurity at this stage, right? And that's where we are with a lot of critical infrastructure, systems that are kind of caught in how to do some of this. Development, testing, verification, validation, deployment, redeployment, upgrade deployments, redesign, replacement, subsystem replacement, operations and maintenance, retirement and replacement. And the OT cybersecurity risk mitigations are usually applied here. So that's what we're saying. That's what CIE is, is focusing on. Next slide. Here's our recent publications. Um, I don't remember what CSER is, DOE CSER. Trying to get um, Ginny and all of my INL cohorts to, uh, to be able to um, when they use an acronym like CSER, if you're not automatically already a cybersecurity person, and I'm not fully, you might already know that acronym, but everybody else is in the dark and it can add a lot of, we know it's allied to the Department of Energy, but I don't know what CSER is. You can see there's some SANS, ICS concepts video. There's the CIE and <coughs> Consequence-based cyber-informed engineering methodologies can deliver engineered industrial systems for holistic system cybersecurity. So that was June of last year. With interview, interviews from INL um, with 1898 and company, and this is a cybersecurity segment of Black and Veatch, I believe. And then West Yost is a prominent um, West Coast, mostly water, wastewater focused uh, consulting engineering firm. They have one guy who's not out in California, and it's Andrew Ort. He's up in Duluth, and he's been on the CIE program, and he's 
he's been doing a lot of these things, I think, up north. <laughs> um, so there's a variety of articles and briefings, and, and these are constantly. Here's Andrew right here. Andy Bachman's another INL guy who's focused in um, risk in grid operations. So he's a GRC, governance, risk, and compliance focused cybersecurity person. Brilliant guy and funny, just incredibly funny. Great sense of humor. So um, this will be in the recording and you'll be able to access all these webs in the YouTube here within a couple of days to a week. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Oh, getting down to how, the, how does all the CIE stuff that we put together work in practice? So as part of the implementation group, we said, let's come up with a real life example of what we've developed so far that can give deliver a real impact to what we're talking about and get people to realize what is this CIE? And so what it is, it's a hands-on training, cyber informed engineering work group that describes a water utility booster pump station and a scenario around that. That's a pretty common thing all over the country, all over the world, really. Next one. So here we've got a water utility booster pump station, you know, diagram where you've got a tank, a couple of tanks, you got a pump, piping, uh, water quality monitoring, control, chemical feeds, chlorine tanks, pressure uh, gauges and, and, and transducers, um, a dry well switch to make sure that if you've got a dry well, you don't want you don't, can't pump anything out of that. So, and this is the control, it's all in the control building, right? And the scenario is, is there's many utilities who have these, but the small municipals, they don't have any connectivity to them. And they send technicians out on a periodic basis to read various gauges, record them, and keep that as kind of a, and then they might put it into a spreadsheet because they don't have a SCADA. You know, they're not, they're not connecting any of this equipment. And so the scenario is there's a small municipal water utility that operates these regional water distribution system with an array of booster pump stations. Right, Because they have a constrained budget, the utility must optimize a small workforce to cover all the operational aspects from routine maintenance to emergency repairs. Can you imagine what some of the small utilities in North Carolina is going through in Georgia and Tennessee and Kentucky as a result of Hurricane Helene? Oh, I don't want to think about it. Um, so a significant limitation for this small municipal water utility is the absence of advanced remote monitoring management systems. They got a number of these booster stations all out there. So the goal of this exercise is to understand how both cybersecurity professionals and engineers can complement each other in the shared venture to protect the utility's water distribution network as it moves toward a more technologically advanced cloud-enabled operational mode or modes. So that's the scenario behind the exercise. Next slide. We look at it like this. And we go, okay, they secured a rural grant to enable modernization with SCADA and cloud connectivity. And then upon a selecting a vendor with expertise in cloud solutions for the water sector, the municipality was introduced to a suitable software solution. Cool. It, it sounds good, right? They're walking the right steps. So here's what the cyber solution review was. It has a qualifying secure development life cycle, very mature demonstrated processes. They provided a SBOM, which is a software bill of materials. It could be examined, right? Component infrastructure is up to date. So nothing that's really out of date that could implement a clean installation and updating and commissioning and operation of this remote monitoring capability cloud-based. And there's mature vulnerability release process with regular patches, 24-7 support availability. So this is the this is the creds of the, the vendor, right? And so they're reputable and qualified. They've got a SOC type two and FedRAMP certifications if needed. And there's great physical security around the pumping stations so that Let's say a hacker has been watching one of the, the small utility and says, well, I'm going to pose myself as someone who's 
one of their, you know, guys who goes in and, and takes, takes readings. And so they get back past the physical security, but this has been, this has been updated now. So great physical security. They're very mature, experienced in hosting critical infrastructure services, and they have a demonstrated response and restoration capability. So they look very capable. A lot of companies are like this from an IT base, information security base. Do you see anything in here that talks about control systems? There really isn't. So the entry, network entry point has a standard security package, monitoring and logging traffic on this interface according to standard practice for IT and data, and logging interfaces with organizational logging system. Traffic in and out is encrypted between the cloud provider and the internal network. So that, that's a great thing, right? They're, in, they're encrypting the data, whatever that data is, operational data, controls data, whatever. But there's still a possibility that because this is a cyber physical system, someone can get through this, these safeguards. Maybe an internal disgruntled employee takes a member stick in, captures some information, takes it home, figures out a way. That's one. So the at the small municipal utility, the finance and accounting has passed off, information tech has passed off, cybersecurity, but engineering operations they're like what should be our input to this to this water this water scenario this booster pump scenario subsystem what can we do as an upgrade to the subsystem or to the booster pump system to make sure it's not hackable because it's going to be cloud connected what can we add that can always be and always require some kind of manual intervention, maybe manual upgrading. Somebody to go on site, not, not regularly, doesn't need the periodic visitation that we had a that we set the system up to prevent the cost of driving out there, time and but somebody who can always who can go maybe once a quarter, right? Four times a year. So they're going to reference the cyber informed engineering implementation guide that asks a lot of different kinds of questions, guidance questions, so that you can come to an answer. So here we have where it's now cloud-based monitoring and control. How would you upgrade this to be more secure? The way it is. Any, anybody here physically in the audience? Anybody online have any idea what could be done to this pump or to the control panel to make it more secure? Here's one answer. A mechanical time delay reel. Can't be hacked. It's mechanical. Somebody's got to physically go out there and change it for, I mean, some of the, the mechanical ones don't have an automatic seasonal, right? Um, what do they call it? Daylight savings time. You have to change those. You've got to dial them up. So that's one way to impact the cyber physical system such that that can't change and that booster pump station can always work based upon that mechanical time delay relay. Other attempts can be made, but you can implement that time delay relay that that's really the, the, the stopgap measure. So there's that's one of the approaches that this implementation guide helped resolve and, and come to a, to a conclusion. So yeah, so now the engineering operation says, we've looked at this, it, it, it checks all the boxes now, the last box, so engineering is, is good with this and they implemented it and uh, off they went. So this is, um, this is the presentation, the overview of cyber-informed engineering, um, and I'll entertain any questions. Did I put you all to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> Was I too monotonic? Was I, you know?
Could you go a little more into what that time delay relay would do? I mean, does it mean if someone wanted to start the system, you couldn't, you know, automatically start up? You would think there would be a delay that you would mechanically set to like, okay, fine, I'm going to send the signal to turn on and we we'll, won't do it right. You mean? Well, since it's a booster pump, right? It would need a signal. It's a mechanical based time delay, really. So it would run for so long. Um, you've, you've worked with these, right? In the olden days? I have. Not in an application like this. Okay. Um, so a mechanical, there's, so there's several different types of mechanical time delay relays, right? There's a there's a 24 hour clock. Um, and so you would, and, and they would implement maybe how long the booster pump would run based upon that time setting. And so that would be kind of the, the default. And you could modify some things, but it would all come down to that default. And so what it does is the, the scenario was for remote monitoring. So you're, you're monitoring how those booster pump stations are working. This isn't necessarily a remote control scenario, right? Because these are low cost things. Okay. Your, your slide made it sound like it did control as well. So I wasn't sure. Did it really? Maybe I read it right. I think the point is not that you need to tell how you use the device, but having kind of an old school system offline that can keep you running in an emergency. Okay. That's what I read into that. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of look at it like. You know, we, we've got our tank system here at Dunwoody where we do a lot of pumping back and forth. We have some devices that are just, um, they don't require any programming and they, you know, like a, like an emergency, you know, float switch or something for level or something. If it gets too high, we have a mechanical break that's going to cut it. It wouldn't matter who yeah. hacked it, right? They could hack it all day long and run the pump till it's blue in the face, but but this is going to physically isolate power to that. So hardwired in a lock. Hardwired in the lock, which is like a mechanical relay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, would be simple. Like, very simple. Yeah, and so and have your high pressure switch and your low pressure switch, and that would run the pump even if the pressure control loop wasn't working. Right, <clears throat> but you but you could tie in the dry well switch so that the the dry the time the relay could it, it could be a disable if you've got a dry well. Go back a couple slides, EJ, where it has all the text here. A couple more, a couple more, right here. So it says, with a constrained budget, the utility must optimize a small workforce to cover all operational aspects from routine maintenance to emergency repairs. A significant limitation for the utility is absence of advanced remote monitoring and management systems. So management may have led you that it's remote control. So the well, well it's blurred, it said cloud control. control. That's it. Oh, it did. Oh, cloud-based monitoring and control. Yeah, for the pump. Right. So. But you're saying like key aspects you would isolate from that, keep it mechanical, so you'd have to physically be there, or some physical device would limit. For changes, it. yes. And maybe not a mechanical device specifically, but one that's not hooked up to any network. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's going, it's, to, it's going to respond regardless of the network. Yeah, it's air gapped and it's kind of a default manual setting. And with the way modern electronics, if you don't connect it to a network, you can program it to do very sophisticated things, right? So that was one scenario where the CIE guidance helped the community of practice come up with that scenario. So that we all went through that. And I didn't, I didn't mechanical. Did not come to my mind. The big thing I think what you're saying is think about what are the most important things you would not want to have remotely uh, hackable. I mean, you don't want anything to be, but I mean, like you don't want your bleach control to be hackable. Right. You know? And if you're in gas control, you don't want your odorant to be hackable. Right. And so, and it's different if you've got an existing system. We're talking about training engineers to come up with these questions as they're designing a new system. How do we prevent some of this capability from occurring? Right. Okay. 
and balancing things out. Like, yes, we don't have a budget for yes. everything, but we can do all this stuff at, at low cost by putting in the cloud and letting somebody who's specialized deal with that, but we still deal with the small side. There's there's some default kind of, yeah, default operations and any anything sophisticated where they don't get control, but they do a lot of monitoring. They can do an auto analysis. And then you take it back, all that analysis goes back to engineering about, well, how do we want to update this system or upgrade this system? Or how do we want to make modifications to the system? And maybe those have to go back on a quarterly basis with a with a visit. But it's still lower cost than a, a weekly truck drive by oh, yeah. and capturing data on a, on a tablet or a notepad. It's not just expense, it's just geometrically impossible to monitor everything in that whole time. Yeah. Uh, small utilities who might be spread out uh, over several counties in rural Minnesota, they got they got one guy. He spent all his, his or her time driving around. All controlled valves. That's not that commonplace. A lot of stuff has to be manually done. That's good, so you can't hack it, but that's also prohibitive if you have an emergency. So, in the... Uh, in what was the uh, that publications? Will be I have to put that up. So that's that's my overview of CIE. If there's no other questions, there's I think we're question done. In the chat, I'm sorry. Question in the chat. Is there okay. asking about uh, physical security uh, guidance in the standard? Oh, Seth. Well, because we're not trying to mandate things, this is not a standard for small utility booster pump stations. But is there guidance in like the questions, the, the prompting questions that you were mentioning were in the in the guide? in the implementation guide? Do you have a lock on the door? Is there people? Is there? Lock? There is some questions that ask about physical security. Yes, so we try and cover as much about security, not just cybersecurity. Or operations security, but but operations with security would include physical. So yeah, we do have some of that guidance. And so I'd I'd uh, I don't know, EJ, can you uh, look at that that implementation guide yeah. URL and yeah, can you pull it out of the uh, and put it in the chat? Back further, right? No, it's right here. No, right back further. Uh, a couple more. Right, uh, recent publications. There should be the implementation guide in there. Implementation guide right there. And Seth, I sent you an email with a link to the IE resource library. Could you paste that in the chat? That one right there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's grab the whole thing. Yeah. There we go. Nice. Pop that in the chat and people can grab it, download it. You have to kind of register. Um, if you're using an alias, Seth, huh. um, INL will sniff you out. But uh, you know what I think is interesting, Tom, is it's as we talk about how all the all the high tech stuff's going to happen. Then we use a mechanical <laughs> relay or, or switch or something. Or, you know, it's like it reminds me of like we used to have on, on the submarine when I was on. We used to have gauges, analog gauges, yeah, that had like electric contacts on them. So as the needle would would approach like a, an alarm point, it would actually make electrical contact on that, <laughs> and we could use that as a safety measure. I mean, that's again like a mechanical relay or a mechanical contact or right. something I think that Dwyer still makes something like that. Do they really? I think so. It's like it's like some of those might Dwyer? be. Dwyer, yeah, yeah, I could some, believe it. Some of that stuff might become popular, again, yeah. you know, based upon what you're talking about here. Well, so. and you know, we we talk about keep it simple, yeah. Right? Keep it simple when you design, and sometimes the lowest cost stuff is the mechanically simpler That's simple right. part. That's right. It's just a drum, drum sequencer. Drum sequencer. There's <laughs> another example. <laughs> you're too young to know about this. <laughs> um, yeah. Hey, so thanks for for joining in. And um, for your questions, I hope I was able to address them. And uh, 
we'll have we'll have one of our I'll get one of my other community practice um, members come and awesome. do another one updated, and maybe I'll get Maurice to talk about the standards. He's he's a he's a practitioner at um, at Auburn, I believe. So uh, what a round of applause for Tom! Hey. Oh. No sandwiches, no sandwiches. <laughs> and I'll, re all. I'll remind everybody, it's pretty simple to find these after the fact. If you want to get uh, access to these, these will be posted on YouTube. Easiest way to find them is just uh, type in ISA Twin Cities Tech Talks, and you'll find them on YouTube really, really quick and easy. So. And not TAC Talks. No, tech. T-E-C-H. T-E-C-H. <laughs> you had a little typo in your... Uh-oh. It was no, Tech no. Talk. No, Tech Talks. So. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. And...